Welcome to our event today. Uh, I'm Michael Marr with the Center for Energy Studies here at the Baker Institute. Uh, one of the things that uh, really drives our analysis here at the Baker Institute is what's happening in the U.S. development and stuff. But that really is a small part of what we look at because what's most important looking into the future is who's going to be using oil and gas. And when you look at the, the future, all the growth that's forecast for um, energy is not going to happen in the U.S. It's not going to happen in Europe. A lot of it's going to be driven by countries like India, China, Southeast Asia, Latin America. So to really start to understand where the future of demand growth is going to be and how those countries, as they become more economically developed, how they develop their, econ their energy use is, is critically important. And that's why we have someone like Suman Berry today, because I think India is one of the key th countries to understand where the energy future is going to be. So I, I thank you for coming today, and I am going to introduce Russell Green, who is, who is our Will Clayton Fellow in International Economics here at the Baker Institute, who worked with Suman, and he'll introduce Suman. Thank you for coming. Good morning. Well, it's really my uh, pleasure to have Suman Berry here today. He's uh, I've known him for almost 10 years since I started going to India and uh, really became aware of him almost immediately because he's one of India's top policy economists. Uh, when I met him, he was the head of the National Council for Advanced Economic Research, which is one of India's top economics think tanks. Uh, and uh, right as about the same time as I was leaving India, he was as well uh, to go be the chief economist at Shell Energy. Uh, he, was, he was there at The Hague for five years uh, and just recently has returned to Delhi. He's uh, written a new book, which I think he'll, he'll mention. Um, but uh, one of the great things about Suman is not only is he deeply knowledgeable about uh, India, of course, and the energy sector in particular, but he also has much broader capabilities. He spent many years working on uh, Latin America with the World Bank. He uh, is currently also a, a fellow at the Belgian think tank Bruegel, where he works on very big picture economic policy issues uh, like what's going on with the G20. Um, but today uh, we're here to, to, um, to listen to what Suman's thoughts are on the future of India's energy sector. Uh, so I'll be uh, brief, but just uh, uh, wanted to, to say thank you to all of you for braving the weather and uh, and coming today. And uh, you know we're we're happy to have all of you because we know you must be extremely interested in the topic to to be motivated to come today. Uh, with that, uh, let me let me ask Suman to come up and uh, give his remarks. Michael Russell, thank you, and thank you all for being here on this rough morning. If uh, I, I sound more careworn than normal, it's because most of the night went rearranging flights to try and get out uh, earlier than I was going to. Uh, it's a great um, pleasure and honor to, to be here, and I'm very grateful uh, to the Baker Institute for hosting me. But exactly as Russell said, uh, this is a self-selected choice group, which probably knows dimensions about what I'm going to talk about that I don't. So I do want it to be a conversation. And uh, my purpose in the, first, in the next 20, 25 minutes is going to be to provide a framework. Uh, as you've just heard, um, India you know, is going to be an important player on the demand side in global energy markets. And I'm going to be talking about that. Um, I think there are two kind of um, images or um, that um, I'd like you to have in mind. Firstly, that India, in some ways, should be thought of like Western Europe, which is uh, that it is, or oh, Japan for that matter, uh, that uh, it's a source of demand, but up till now at least, seems relatively 
um, devoid of domestic resources. And so as its growth takes place, it is going to be forced to engage with the world energy system to an extent that it has chosen to avoid uh, up till now. Secondly, that while India is going to be growing, it remains a poor country, um, and uh, therefore this does impact a great deal on its, uh, on its energy future. And the third is that because of the dependence on the rest of the increasing dependence on the rest of the world, energy security is a, a major consideration uh, for India. So th these are some of the big themes that uh, we are going to, that I'm going to be touching on as the basis for the uh, for the discussion um, with all of you. Okay. So the goals of the talk then are basically to uh, just share with you, uh, without going becoming too geeky about it, uh, model-based scenarios for Indian energy that we um, prepared for this book that was referred to. Uh, it's a book that uh, reflects uh, joint work between Shell and um, the uh, and two Indian think tanks, uh, and I'll talk a bit more, more about it. One of the one of the out, um, uh, themes of the book is okay. There's a lot of uncertainty about uh, the next 30 years, technology, India's own growth, uh, the geopolitical situation. So what are the major technical, financial, and political challenges ahead? But because many of you, you know, are interested in the here and now, what, after setting out that framework, I'm going to be talking about what we have seen the Modi government actually do. As you, many of you would know, uh, Prime Minister Modi took office three years ago. And I think it's fair to say that his government, we don't call it administration, has actually been quite active in energy. And I'd like to, in a sense, provide an interpretation of what I think they've been doing and why they've been doing it against the longer term background uh, uh, that we covered in the book. So uh, th this is the book, it's, uh, it's joint work. Um, I happen to be at the top of the masthead uh, only because my last name starts with Barry, but I was representing, uh, with B, uh, I was representing Shell as, uh, as the global chief economist. The global chief economist's role in Shell. Are there people from Shell here? I was just wondering. Uh, okay, thanks. Oh, hi, Peter, how are you? Good to see you. Um, so, um, as you would imagine, the global chief economist's role is a global role, but uh, about uh, seven years ago, uh, senior uh, Shell's, I shouldn't say are any longer, um, Shell's senior policy body, uh, the executive committee, charged the uh, scenarios team where the chief economist sits to do deep dives in important countries. Uh, we started with China, that work is continuing, and I was asked to lead the engagement on India having just come from the think tank in India, and we did this in collaboration with uh, two Indian energy think tanks. So it's joint work, and as I go through the numbers, um, you'll see, in a sense, the benefit we got out of uh, having a variety of views, both international and, uh, and domestic. <coughs> so um, this is an energy-savvy group. Um, I do want to set out the, if you like, the terminology in general and some orders of magnitude, because this is one of the reasons we thought that it was worth putting this book out to stimulate Indian debate. So at least in Shell, and I don't know how widespread this terminology is, we draw a distinction. Uh, these are not Indian numbers. These are global numbers. Uh, but uh, uh, they are important to establish the framework within which I'm going to talk. So. Um, by the way, Russell, will this be available online as a presentation? Okay, so, you know, um, it, before people feel they have to take photographs, etc., cetera, it, it is going to be available online. Um, so, uh, essentially, there are three stages in which you can be talking about energy. There is raw energy, what we call primary energy, and that is the, um, that's the, inner circle there, okay? So these are the things that we talk about when we talk about the primary energy mix. And this is the global primary energy mix in 2012. Um, 
It would have changed some, but this is a sluggish, so not all that much. And so this shows you that renewables uh, you know, are a fast growing, but minor part globally of the energy mix. Oil, gas, and coal are the biggies. Uh, nuclear is slightly larger than renewables. So a lot of my discussion is going to be about the innermost circle, uh, which is the supply and the blend of primary energy sources in India, uh, even though this is global. Okay, so then that gets transformed into what in Shell, at least, we called um, el energy carriers. What is the means by which primary energy gets transformed into useful and usable um, uh, products? The key point here is that so much of the debate around the world is about fuel sources for electricity generation, coal versus gas versus renewables. But it's important to know that uh, usable energy, even in the world as a whole, dominated by countries like the US, only 18% of that is, at the moment, uh, electricity, and the goals are to try and push that up to about 30% for the rich world. 82% um, is other stuff. And then, you know, this goes ultimately to uh, the final demand, uh, of which the residential sector is about a quarter, industry and services, the productive sectors is about a half, and transport again is 26%. Uh, I'm, I'm putting this out because I'll be using the terminology and I'm going to be focusing primarily on the primary energy mix and then I'm going to be focusing on the final demand sectors. And uh, one reason, as I say, we wrote the book was that the, the dialogue in India was entirely about the, the primary fuel mix for electricity, whereas what we wanted people to focus on is, hey, there's a big world out there, and you need to be working on demand, which they're trying to do, but you also need to be working on things like uh, transportation and industry. Okay, um, so um, we looked ahead to 2050 for two reasons. One is that this was work that was take going on while the discussions about Paris uh, were underway, and as, as you know, the, the framework for thinking about commitments uh, under the, uh, uh, the Paris Agreement is 2030, but then thinking about emissions till 2050, it, we thought that was a useful time horizon. There was also uh, an India-specific motivation, which is that India this year um, uh, marked 70 years of its independence, so 2047, which is around 2050, is, will be 100 years since it's been independence. So I want you to th you know, think about, as it were, the transition in the United States from, say, 1776 to 1876. You know how the US was transformed in those 100 years. Arguably, you know, the next 30 years will be as important for India's economic transformation, which is what I put in my title, as the period after the Civil War was in the US. And so what we are talking about is an energy system that makes possible and accompanies uh, India's transformation. In a while, I'll show you, in a sense, where India is from a comparative point of view, but as I said, India is the poorest member of the group called the G20, and one of the implications of this is that it is still at an early stage in industrialization. Uh, I don't know if there are economic historians in the room, but the real question is, how does India make sure that its energy system is fit for purpose for the next phase of its manufacturing, uh, which is an aspiration that it has for all kinds of reasons, uh, which I'll come to. So over these 30 years, we th think of these four transitions as being the ultimate drivers of what's going to happen in Indian energy. And what are these transitions? Just briefly, you can see much more detail in the book, is that India at the moment is still substantially a rural society, an agricultural society, and to an astonishing degree, uh, rural folks still use traditional uh, fuel sources. I'm talking about firewood, I'm talking about animal dung, etc. So uh, it is a commitment of this government on which they're delivering big time 
to move households from traditional to modern sources of energy. And for people over here who are in the gas business, uh, a lot of that is making um, LPG uh, available around the country. And that is a big campaign, and it, it is, for other, amongst other reasons, for health purposes, because uh, the burning of uh, biomass indoors is uh, incredibly bad, uh, or is a powerful source of indoor um, air pollution. Sort of overlapping with that is uh, the shift from rural to urban. We have certainly seen, in the case of China, over the last 20 years, uh, terrific urbanization. India is slightly unusual because uh, the pace of urbanization keeps, to some extent, disappointing. But it remains the case that India's cities are going to be uh, growing. Um, I think I'm right in saying that the city I live in, New Delhi, is already the largest or the second largest metropolis in the world. It depends on how you define the boundaries, and we, we're just getting going. And the thing about urban patterns of consumption is that they're different from rural. But in some ways, because uh, the cities have yet to, to kind of come into existence, um, uh, there's an opportunity through things like land use planning, mass transit, forgive my saying so, to make sure that Indian cities perhaps don't end up like LA and Houston, but end up a bit more like, uh, uh, a bit more like uh, Tokyo and, and Paris. Uh, or the hay where I was, and you know, uh, to uh, it's it's a it's transformational experience to be in a city with good transit. Uh, third, I've already mentioned integration with global energy markets because uh, there is this demand, uh, growth in demand, and because at least on the basis of um, of uh, geological exploration up till now, uh, uh, if India is India is already very highly dependent for hydrocarbons on, on imports. This, uh, it's a source of concern uh, that this will grow in scale. What it really means for folk in this room is that India is going to start moving from being you know, a bit player uh, to perhaps being, towards the end of the period, almost as important in global energy markets as Europe is right now. So. Uh, it's not going to be as significant, maybe, as the U.S. had been before the shale revolution. <coughs> but it's going to have to become a bigger player. And arguably, it's not quite ready for that. And then for, finally, environmental sustainability. I've talked about it more broadly, and not just in terms of decarbonization, because what is of great concern in India, as much as in China, is uh, local air pollution which is associated with coal, it's associated with the internal combustion engine, et cetera. So I think uh, there was a, f a phrase, Peter will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that uh, the folk uh, dealing with new energy technologies and Shell used to use, that the future is not about breakthrough technologies, but it's about technologies breaking out. And what I would say is, that these are drivers that are already evident. They're evident politically. They're evident um, uh, in, uh, in the government's uh, priorities. And so we have anchored uh, our modeling work on the, um, in the belief that these are going to be the, the, the deep drivers of India's energy uh, policies going out. Let me take uh, two kinds of checks, um, basically, uh, does this make sense to the audience? And Russell, how am I doing for time? Okay, great. Okay, so so far so good, guys. Okay, great. Fine. Um, now, um, the next couple of slides are going to be uh, sorry to see India in a global context. This is not our work. This is work uh, that comes from. Uh, a discussion uh, from an article in The Economist magazine. This is interesting because this basically talks about uh, oil consumption, and this is not all energy, and this looks at aggregate size of the economy, whereas my next slide is going to be talking about per capita income. So why did I put this into the pack? 
I put this into the pack essentially to make the point that each successive wave of development tends to be more energy efficient than what preceded it because of technological improvements. So what you see at the very end of the US, EU, and China graphs is that more or less in terms of the aggregate size of the economy, these three entities today are about the same size of economy. And yet the oil intensity of the Chinese economy is lower than that of the EU as a whole, the European Union. And the European Union for its part, which is in aggregate about the size of the US economy, is considerably more oil efficient than, uh, the, um, than, than the US. Um, so what we are seeing is that India, which is about 20% uh, the size of uh, the Chinese economy, uh, you know, is plodding along in a, in a good way, that it is already relatively low uh, in terms of, um, of its oil intensity. And the argument would be, and I'm making this point because obviously lots of people rightly say that, look, energy efficiency, energy f efficiency, that's where India needs to work. Uh, and Surely it does, because this is an, an important resource. I just wanted to give you a sense of where we were today in oil efficiency for the size of the economy we have. Now I come to, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, did, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, let, let me uh, uh, go to this, because it fits more naturally. This now is, as it were, the other chart that I talked about, which uh, associates um, per capita income with overall energy efficiency. This is uh, uh, stuff that's proprietary to Shell. Um, uh, and it, it describes what are energy ladders which is to say, as countries grow, uh, what happens here, we're talking about primary energy. Remember, primary energy was basically the rawest forms of energy. And what we see here is that the US and Canada uh, are amongst the, the most hungry um, economies in terms of the energy that's required for um, to, to support their lifestyles, then come a, a bunch of European countries, which typically tend to be uh, more efficient for a whole bunch of reasons. Then you have Japan, which has succeeded in being a resource-poor uh, manufacturing nation, but which, with good policies, has ended up being much, much more energy efficient. But here, our, our focus is on India, and I think this is the India chart, and what it shows is that compared with China, India has been, because compared with China, it is less well endowed with uh, energy resources other than coal. So it is below the, um, below the curve, and to anticipate what I'm going to talk about, about our modeling projections, um, we, you know, we've, uh, use one set of scenarios to plot where India could be in 2060 and 2100 under the right policies. And again, you know, because where India is a latecomer, it is possible to uh, conceive that it could become a rich country. This, this is kind of what being rich means, being about uh, 15,000, 20,000 per capita, while not being as, uh, while being frugal. So that's the title there. It is already flu frugal if you want to compare it with China. Uh, and it is not un inconceivable to think that it could remain so. Um, OK, so uh, that's both uh, benchmarking it globally and uh, also looking ahead a little bit. Now, how did we look ahead? That's what I want to come to now. So um, I want here to focus initially on uh, 
these two bars, uh, which where OCNS refers to oceans and MTNS refers to mountains. Now, why, what the hell are they doing in this chart? Uh, essentially, uh, the contribution that um, I brought as the chief economist of Shell to this work was the work that Shell's Global Scenarios team, located in The Hague, which I, I was a member of, had done to look at global energy supply, demand, and patterns um, into um, the middle of the decade. And um, those of you who um, you know, um, know something about Shell know that Shell does not believe in kind of single point forecasts, uh, although they need to uh, uh, for nearer term planning, but uh, they encourage kind of blue sky thinking about thinking about where the world is going, what is going to be, global society is going to be, and then teasing out a story uh, about what that means for global energy. It's all online at shell.com uh, scenarios, but essentially for this exercise, uh, there, there were the two polar scenarios called mountains and oceans run something like this, and the purpose of the work was to take the global picture and bring it to India. So mountains is basically a world, um, there's a lot of um, uh, discussion of why it might be this way, but I'll give you the highlights, is a world where essentially growth, uh, it, uh, politics is dominated by an elite, the 1%, the elite does you know some good things, some bad things. The bad things are they hold down growth. The good things are, and we're talking now not of a single country but globally, that they allow the spread of fracking to other parts of the world. Those of you who are you know in in the uh, ENP business would know that you know the U.S. is not alone in having. Uh, shale deposits. I mean, there's plenty of gas around the world. The issue is really the politics of overcoming not in my backyard, et cetera, et cetera. So th the thought experiment behind the mountain scenario is that all of those uh, restrictions on the spread of uh, unconventional gas get eased in Europe, in China, in Argentina, places that we know have these resources. And so the thought experiment is, how does the global energy system react if two things happen? If gas becomes abundant, and also if various energy conservation measures, as well as um, CCS, uh, spread in the way that they could, but I don't... Uh, uh, that potentially they could. So oceans is a gas-dominated world. I mean, mountains is a... Oceans is uh, a kind of a... Uh, what would be... Um, I hesitate here to talk about Republicans and Democrats, but let me just say that oceans is a world where essentially um, lots and lots of grass, grassroots opposition to things like gas, etc. The consequence of that is that gas is squeezed out of the global energy mix compared to what it could be. That means that oil um, becomes expensive, survives longer, and paradoxically, uh, the consequence of that is that globally, uh, renewables actually find it easier to make their way in the world because um, they are in the money economically. So that's the globe. Now, what we bring here is several things. Uh, so the, 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 the three institutions that partnered uh, in this each did their own scenarios, and I, uh, it, the details are in the book. I just want to make three points. The first is that even though economic growth rates differ, uh, and Shell was the most conservative, uh, you can see that between 2011, where we're talking about here, the unit is millions of tons of oil equivalent, that from about 700 in 2011, we're talking at the most conservative, uh, which is the, the uh, mountain scenario of Shell, we're talking about energy demand at least doubling. But most of the other scenarios talk about uh, or, or, or 
anticipate a, a near tripling of energy demand. And let me just say that energy demand in India has been growing at about 6% per year since 2000. Uh, so the, the, um, the uh, demand for energy today is about double what it was in 2000. So the first issue is the issue of scale. The second issue is the drivers of the primary energy mix. And what you see here is that for the reasons I mentioned earlier, that even that assuming uh, a range of policies, it continues to be the case that oil, which is at the bottom there, continues to be a pretty substantial par uh, part of the energy mix. You can also see that what we have going on is even over the next 40 years, or 30 years rather, a, a kind of a horse race between coal, oil, and gas, with, yes, renewables coming in, and to some extent nuclear, but really the, uh, the issues and the uncertainties are about how these three important fuels compete with each other. And if I can anticipate uh, some of the stuff I'm going to come to, uh, I think that a big question for people in this town is whether gas is going to be... Seven minutes left? Okay, good. I'm sorry? You're at 20. Oh, goodness. Okay, right. Okay, fine. Well, then I need to move on. Um, okay. So, yeah? We do have some time. Okay, good. But as long as I'm not boring people, uh, it's okay? Okay, fine. So, so this is, uh, so what's the takeaway from this? The takeaway from this is that, you know, under most reasonable uh, uh, sort of projections, um, India has the capability to continue growing, partly because of its labor force and partly because it's poor, and that, that is going to require an expansion in scale of, uh, of its energy system. And that expansion of scale is essentially going to uh, going to still involve the three imp currently important uh, primary sources of energy. Now, this ar arouses howls of protest in India because uh, the government has just come out with a draft energy policy which showed a con continued reliance on coal. And, you know, it was slanged by, uh, by the NGOs to say, no, that this is not um, forward-looking enough, um, et cetera, et cetera. We'll come to that in the discussion. Okay, now uh, I mentioned that electricity is only 18% globally of energy services, and um, in India uh, it's, it's less than that, but it is going to grow. Uh, the point here being that, uh, again, I just want you to focus on oceans and mountains, uh, is that, yes, there will be some displacement of, of coal, that will take place, but um, it's going to take time. And indeed, one of the most important policy questions for India now is what kind of um, incentives or what kind of policy regime to uh, put in place um, for coal. Um, I'll come back to that when I describe what the government has been doing. OK, so um, let me just then move to policy and issues. So. Uh, I'll, I'll just um, talk through these, indicate what in the book we describe as some of the big issue areas, and then end up talking about what the government has done. So I've already said that um, the focus of the book is really on the primary energy mix. And the big debate partly because India signed up, um, I mean, participate in the Paris Agreement, is what will replace coal, gas, renewables, how quickly, in which applications, and at what cost. Um, this is perhaps the most contentious issue uh, in India at the moment. I've al already mentioned the issue of energy security, that India, like Europe, is resource poor, but surrounded by cheap, though politically risky, fossil energy sources. And so how should it res respond? And that's just a way of saying that, you know, uh, we, are, uh, we sit on the edge of the Gulf, and uh, it's the most obvious thing, particularly given 
um, given prices at the moment, is for us to become dependent on uh, fossil energy imports, so hydrocarbon imports from the Gulf. So, but. It's an unstable region, and I think the kinds of issues that the U.S. faced uh, when it uh, when it was uh, a major importer from um, from the Gulf, from OPEC, are issues that Indian India is wrestling with now. And then um, politics, policies, pricing. How can competition play a bigger role in energy markets? I didn't get time to say this before, but really, essentially, for the last 30 years, energy in India has been dominated by the government, not only as a policymaker, but as an owner. Uh, uh, the major oil companies were nationalized uh, in the uh, mid-70s. Um, and um, it is, in, at the moment, both retail and exploration, production, importing, it's all in the public sector. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about what needs to happen and what is happening in that space. But the, the basic issue is how can competition play a bigger role in energy markets? So um, this is uh, a little breathless, but let me finally just talk about the framework we set out and then talk um, in about two or three minutes about uh, what, what I see the government up to and then open it up for discussion. So we, we talked. Uh, the important contribution we'd hoped that this book would make was to talk about energy across the board, because India doesn't have a tradition of discussing it. We discuss it fuel by fuel, renewables, coal, oil and gas. Um, uh, whereas what we were talking about was opening up markets um, uh, so, that, um, so that the right choices were made. Um, and a very important determinant of the path India follows uh, is obviously infrastructure. We drew a distinction between hard and soft infrastructure. I would just make the point here that really what you decide uh, or where you decide to guide the energy system depends a lot on the future role of coal. Why do I say that? Because the, uh, we have large coal deposits there in the heartland, far away from the centers of population. There's been a lot of reliance on imported coal. Do you build up basically an internal railway transportation system? Do you build up a port system? So thinking about the future of coal is, is pretty important in sending out those signals. But secondarily, building out the pipeline structure for natural gas is going to be very important also for the infusion of gas into, into the system. Um, so that's one big policy area where we felt an integrated view would be needed. The second I've already talked about is pricing, that we, uh, as uh, one of the commentators on our book put it, India has no energy market other than rural firewood, firewood where price clears the market. It's completely blocked with administrative controls of various kinds. And uh, the present government is cautiously trying to unwind that. But uh, essentially, uh, you know, it's going to be a long journey to get price discovery, as the economists call it, being done by market prices uh, and using taxation rather than regulation to, to move to decarbonization. Uh, and part of the reason that we are in the mess that we are is because the, the whole energy system has been riddled with subsidies, and each subsidy has its uh, constituent. Uh, there's a big discussion in technology, but basically, I think uh, up there, I, I give you the conclusion, which is that you know we don't think that there's going to be a silver bullet on technology that we can see, uh, but that um, uh, there are things to be done. But probably the most difficult and contentious issue is make versus buy. And there's a, uh, as well as the issue of avoiding lock-in. So the question of how you make yourself um, flexible as technology uh, evolves is, uh, is, is a challenge which is not very easy uh, for a state-dominated system to kind of react to. 
Um, and by make versus buy, we, I mean, like the US, we have this issue right now about how to react to, for example, solar panels coming from China. And so there's a strong domestic lobby saying that, you know, this is undercutting the, um, the system. And, um, and then finally, I've talked already about the fact that India is going to become a much more important player in global energy markets. Okay, um, I th uh, and then all of this uh, is going to require major changes in policy and governance, uh, where the key point is really this one, uh, and this is most evident in, uh, in electricity, but it's true across the board, which is that um, energy policy, if the state is involved, does become an important area for uh, for populism, if you like, and this has been particularly the case with respect to electricity distribution, uh, where uh, the attempt by regulators to push up prices has been frustrated by legislators. Um, and so uh, there's also the point that I made earlier, which is that uh, there is, uh, you, we don't have the equivalent of a Department of Energy, and uh, basically the, dis the decision making is um, uh, undertaken at the level of um, of individual fuel ministries, and the, the responsibilities are divided between uh, between the federal government and the state government. Okay, um, let me then um, just give you some sense of against this background where we need to be heading. Some of the key actions that uh, the Modi government has taken, and then I'll um, hand over to Russell to handle, uh, to uh, do the, master the Q and uh, to handle the Q&A. Um, I think the first point is that a series of cautious actions that have been taken over the last three years are beginning to add up to a, to a commitment to something that's quite new for India, which was uh, this business about competition playing a bigger role in energy markets. Up till, or in the last 20, 20 uh, last 30 years, essentially energy policy was an inside game between public enterprises and the ministry. And while there were attempts by foreign majors, by domestic majors like Reliance and SR, you know, to be players, they kept being edged out. My first, my sense is that this is gradually beginning to change. It's going to be a long struggle, but why am I seeing the winds of change? I think there's quite a bit happening in the downstream in India. And one of the consequences of that is that retail is finally getting opened up. Shell, my, uh, my former employer, had licenses that um, for setting up uh, retail um, outlets, but they chose not to invest in them because the pricing structure was so um, unfavorable. But now Shell is, uh, is uh, reactivating that. And um, they would only do so if they believed that uh, there would be a level playing field, which there hasn't been up till now, in terms of the um, availability and pricing of product. Uh, BP, which is there upstream, has also uh, announced uh, that it's seeking a license for, um, for retail operations in India. This may seem commonplace to those of you who consider it normal that there would be a wide variety of, of gas stations uh, that you uh, would compete on the basis of service and price. But let me tell you that in India, uh, if this becomes a reality and, and there's always a slip between the cup and the lip, um, this would be pretty big. Um, secondly, um, and linked with this, uh, there have been various actions to be slightly more friendly towards um, towards uh, outside parties in um, exploration and production. 
One of the changes that's taken place has been a move to an open acreage licensing policy. Secondly, a very vexed issue, um, uh, which was the pricing of um, <coughs> of um, uh, domestic gas. Um, there has been the first, as it were, uh, chink of an attempt to let um, uh, to let deep deep water exploration enjoy more favorable terms because. I think the government appreciated that it was mad not to provide competitive prices for domestic resources if the consequence is that you are going to be importing LNG from outside. So they are uh, attempting uh, to encourage that. I think the biggest surprise to many of us, though, um, given um, what the uh, traditional attitude of India had been uh, uh, to discussion global negotiations on climate change has been the commitment with which Prime Minister Modi signed up to the Paris um, COP, uh, the Paris Agreement. And why did he do that? Uh, it has resulted in a rather bold commitment uh, f for renewables to constitute, to provide 175 gigawatts of uh, generating capacity by 2022. But I think he did this because of two things. One is that it plays to the energy security theme. But secondly, because he saw this as a way of using Indian brains to work, frankly, with American capital and American uh, minds uh, on the new technological frontier. And he was motivated to do that because there's a great deal of innovation and research going on in China. And I think he felt that um, India need, needed to be playing in this patch. And again, I think in tribute to, um, as it were, his uh, ministers and policy administrators, uh, they seem to have created confidence amongst the private, in the private sector, that the policy regime for renewables is going to be stable enough that it is worth committing significant resources. Um, the overseas private sector, as much as the domestic private sector, uh, in solar and in wind. I mean, this is still on a, um, you know, on a small scale compared with China, but it's uh, it's a beginning. So. Um, uh, this has been rather breathless, but if I wanted to sum up you know, the, uh, the, the takeaways, I would say that uh, the next 30 years w should, uh, could be quite different from the last 30 years in terms of India's um, energy landscape. Different because of compulsions, because our needs are going to make us become a more global player. It's not going to be driven exclusively be d by decarbonization. It's going to be driven by the need to expand something I didn't talk about, energy access, uh, and by the need to ensure um, energy security. And I think that um, since we are in the United States um, and in the capital of energy in the United States, which is Houston, I think that in all kinds of ways, not only the link through the export of gas, but um, th um, through technological cooperation, scientific cooperation. Uh, one, of the, one of the successes of Indo-US cooperation um, has been the, the energy dialogue. And it is my expectation that, that the official level will provide sufficient cover that um, uh, that they sh it should it should make for fruitful uh, both commercial and academic interaction. Okay, I uh, I think we are down to the last ten minutes of the official session. Let me hand over to Russell and thank you for your attention. So we're but, happy to have any questions that anybody might have. Uh, Ken. Yeah. So, come on, thank you very much uh, for being here um, and. and uh, for enduring the weather, even, uh, even though it's not quite cold. You're, you're sure I didn't bring it, right? We have something called the monsoon. <laughs> uh, so I have a question I'd love to get your perspective on. Um, uh, we, we host quite a few international delegations through here for private meetings on energy market developments. 
Um, and about a year and a half ago, we hosted a, a, a delegation from India. Okay. Uh, the discussion was quite remarkable, and it almost lends itself to a schizophrenia, if you will, with regard to how the government's approaching the energy mix. Uh, because on the one hand, you hear a lot about you know, uh, dedication to expanding renewable capacity, and that's certainly very real. But on the other hand, in these sort of smaller private conversations, there's an adamant, uh, 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 sort of, if you will, um, um, attitude towards the development of domestic resources, uh, in particular coal. And I, I asked the question, well, how does that actually juxtapose against the commitments that were met recently made uh, with regard to the Paris Accords? And the, uh, the response was, was very interesting, uh, but it boiled down to uh, development of domestic coal resources will provide hundreds of thousands of jobs. And I thought that was a very interesting response because it's a very different perspective than we see in the developed world particularly in the United States with regard to coal. Um, and I wonder if, if you could perhaps talk a little bit about that because, um, you know, riddled in the conversation were all the issues you were, you were raising with regard to market transparency and price discovery and, you know, promotion of capital inflows from, from, from the international space to develop energy resources. Um, but there was a definite uh, 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 motivation that was energy security driven. Uh, but also economic security. So the idea of creating domestic opportunities for, uh, for people, particularly in rural India, where there's a, a serious issue with regard to energy access, and what we sometimes refer to as, as energy poverty. Okay, one at a time, Russell, or? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, um, so, you know, um, is U.S. energy policy schizophrenic or aligned? <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so that's the point. Uh, so uh, maybe I didn't make the point for, forcefully enough. Um, uh, I, I see the first glimmerings of um, a shift to what I might call a more cosmopolitan view on energy policy. But I in no way was trying to minimize the undertow that, that prevents that. So uh, essentially, um, there's still a lot of ambivalence in India because of what I showed. I mean, we are already frugal in our energy use, and I didn't go get as far as the emissions chart, but it's in the book. So there's certainly a strong sentiment, hey, guys, you know, it's for others to clean up the mess, as it were. We will do what we need to do. And indeed, uh, just last week, to howls of protest, the government's chief economic advisor, Arvind Subramaniam, on leave from the Peterson Institute in Washington, you know, basically um, uh, made a speech saying, you know, uh, coal is cheap, uh, and for a poor country, uh, Forget the energy security side, that the, the costs associated with a, a, a forced rush to renewables in the electricity mix uh, are too much for a poor country to sustain. Okay? So there, there is a debate taking place. I think the point I was trying to make, or we tried to make in the book, is that's only part of the debate. That's the 18% of the debate. And who's thinking about the other 82%, which is substantially about an industrial and manufacturing sector that is largely to come into place. It's about cities, towns becoming cities. So there's a whole lot of stuff that you should be focusing on, on the 82, which does not get discussed at all. And you know, to spend a lot of time thinking about the the um, jostling between coal, gas, and renewables is, you know, frankly looking for the key where the light is rather than where the key is, okay? Um, another argument in all of this is that, you know, India's current deployment of, um, of um, coal is um, considerably smaller than that of the U.S., as it were, so, you know, um, so if it's okay for the U.S., it should be okay for India. But actually, you know, that's in terms of the debate, and you know, Indians prefer debate over practice. Um, 
the reality is right now that, and maybe I should have made this point more forcefully, that the mindset of India at, until now has been a mindset of scarcity. Scarcity in terms of domestic capacity, scarcity in terms of the global uh, availability of resources, and how you operate in that environment. I think the big challenge, not only for India, but particularly for India, given its size, scale, and poverty, is so how do you perhaps respond to a world of abundant and cheap energy? What should you be doing? Because that could be the world that we're in. And certainly, you know, just using standard resource economics, if most of the um, custodians of um, fossil resources, be they coal or be they oil or be they gas, feel that this stuff is for real and there's no, no percentage in leaving the stuff in the ground, I mean, it's going to get even cheaper. So that then raises some really important questions about do you use these cheap global resources? Uh, it's kind of writ large, the point I was making about Chinese solar panels. Do you lock yourself into Chinese solar panels because they're being dumped and sort of benefit from that in the way that the US has done? Or do you worry about the fact that you become over-dependent? So, um, you know, I think I don't think this debate has matured enough for there to be a clear view. I was just saying there are huge green shoots that indicate to me that you know, the policy um, uh, elite or the policy establishment is beginning to start gingerly testing the limits of stuff that up till now was sort of you know, um, uh, outside the pale. Uh, I, let me just say that is a long answer. Um, sorry, it, it, it's an interesting comparison with the U.S., where coal policy may be driven by employment rather than energy-related concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Coal India employs something like two to three million people. Right, it's one of the larger employers in the world. Uh, okay, uh, and it's the largest coal yeah. company in the world. Two questions: um, With the price of oil going so low, and India not increasing its price of the pumps, <coughs> I'm sure the Modi government is making a lot of money. What are they doing to use it back in the industry? That's the short term thing. Second question I had is the Indian rupee to the dollar is about 65 to, to 1. What is thought it's too weak? What if the rupee gets stronger against the dollar? That means it will bring up the lower middle class to the middle class, the middle class to the higher middle class. And that will drive the need for more energy by those people. So what is India thinking about it? Uh. Okay, um, on the first, um, um, uh, sorry, I should have uh, taken note. So, uh, uh, Ty, could you please remind me of the first question? I'm, um, uh, well, the price of oil has gone down a lot. Yeah, um, so um, the, the, I think it's a good sign. Um, so two things, one is that actually, uh, Petroleum taxation in India is, is a nightmare. There's no question about it. And it's, um, and it's not been cleaned up. As you may know, we've just moved to a national kind of system of indirect taxes, something, of course, the US doesn't have through the goods and services tax. But petroleum uh, products uh, are not forming part of that because they are a cash cow, particularly for, for the state governments. Um, uh, I th what the um, government has cleverly chosen to do is to indeed pocket most of the, the benefits of lower international prices uh, by uh, not passing them on and taking them into the fiscal accounts. And indeed, one reason why India's fiscal numbers fis uh, are, look uh, pretty strong is because they have done that. Now, you know, um, there are all kinds of reasons connected with pollution, externalities, et cetera, why, um, you know, countries, including European countries, uh, tend to tax um, petroleum products um, pretty substantially. So I, I don't disagree with that. I think, though, it opens the door to a different discussion that I didn't have time to get into which is that part 
of the slow, and I'm talking about 10 years, of integrating Indian uh, energy markets, particularly oil and gas markets, more with global markets, uh, and encouraging the private sector, is that remorselessly, systematically, uh, the government has been trying to get out of subsidy in the product price. As you know, um, the, the situation the, the Modi government inherited, which uh, to the, uh, in the defense of the previous government was because of the era of $100 oil, was subsidized petrol, subsidized gasoline, subsidized uh, diesel, subsidized kerosene, subsidized LPG. And to its great credit, uh, you know, it has used the decline in global prices to start moving all of those subsidies uh, into other forms, basically using digitalization to provide an income subsidy rather than a product subsidy. So this, to me, is what you do if you have a long-term goal of integrating yourself more with global markets. More interestingly, and um, I didn't think it would happen so quickly, they have, without too much protest, actually moved uh, to uh, the pricing of gas at the pump being adjusted not every quarter, as it used to be, or every month, but daily. Now, I was in this country at the time of the, uh, uh, of the early 70s oil shock, and I do know that it was a big deal for the Nixon administration you know, to actually have what was going on in global energy markets translated. I mean, we see it as commonplace now that you know, uh, different gas stations you know, will compete with each other on the basis of competition. Uh, but it took, you know, it took uh, I think, about 10 years for the US to get there from where it was, because there were price controls on gasoline, I think, uh, in 74, at the time of the oil shock. So all I'm saying is that, look, the India of today is a very different place from the India of 1991. There's no question about that. But I don't think that you know, any single step was that radical, but cumulatively, because people knew where they wanted to get to, they sort of got there, okay? So similarly, in the domination by the government of the energy business, uh, what is the reality today? If indeed renewables are the new frontier, all the renewable capacity is now, investment is now happening in the private sector. There isn't really much happening uh, through, through government um, intervention. Um, what that then raises is the much more difficult challenge of establishing stability in the policy regime. And that is something that India is very bad at in terms of our taxation policy, in terms of you know, the arbitrariness by the, by the government to overrule the regulators. So that's the 15-year journey we kind of need to come through. On your question of middle class, uh, upper middle class, so um, you know, what you say would be right if our inflation rates were where the, uh, uh, where the rest of the world is. Uh, we're getting there, but one of the big, one of the reasons I think that the previous government, there were many reasons, lost the last elections, is that inflation got out of control. So, you know, it's not the nominal exchange rate that really affects the middle class, it's real growth. And so, you know, it's basic, oh, those charts are here. Uh, so, it basically what I was saying was that uh, we're doing okay in terms of the elimination of poverty. We're doing okay in terms of growth. There's one other turkey takeaway I should have stressed, which is that you know, Indians, like Americans, tend to think of, them, of themselves as exceptional, but in lots of ways, we are kind of middle of the road. And so uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, the system, with all of its creakiness, et cetera, produces outcomes that aren't bad, and um, I, I'm fairly confident that, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, I mean, the political class will wake up and smell the coffee. If I had to say, uh, indicate what I most worry about, it is, at the end of the day, uh, the, the politicization of electricity distribution. You know, until you get 
a consensus that that is, you know, that stuff that uh, uh, where politics should not enter, it screws up the entire value chain of electricity generation. And so, uh, you know, um, so that's, that's one issue, and if I could make one other point, um, how the Indian financial system and legal system is going to deal with the inevitability of stranded assets as technologies move around is, I think, a big issue. And this comes back to the question of coal, that, you know, if from a regulatory point of view or a global point of view or a price point of view, you know, Coal is no longer in the money. We're seeing this with gas right now. So who takes the hit? Uh, I think that these are some of the uh, difficult policy issues that, uh, that uh, this government and its successors are going to have to deal with. Uh, Sohan, can I ask you to address uh, uh, natural gas and particularly LNG? I, I think you had 22% shown for the role of of gas and primary How much of that is uh, imported LNG? That was a, a global chart. That was not an Indian chart. Oh, all right. Yeah. I'm surprised it was a no. chart. Okay. I just wanted to yeah. set out the framework, but uh, I'll give you the Indian numbers if you like. I'm interested in the uh, growth prospects for LNG, and uh, looks like uh, the original terminals have been located in Mr. Modi's home state of Gujarat. What is uh, further opportunities? Uh, I see where Shell is looking at a uh, imported uh, LNG terminal uh, uh, technology uh, for the part of India. Well, um, there is a national target uh, to have gas as a whole. And incidentally, uh, slightly to my surprise, uh, the share of domestic gas in total gas consumption in India is higher than of domestic oil in, in total oil consumption. So uh, it's a different matter that we, you know, uh, get all tied up in pricing issues with domestic gas because it's considered a natural re national resource, et cetera, et cetera. I talked a little bit about this. Um, you know, the both in India and in China, and I talk about China because, as I said, um, uh, my colleagues at Shell were also working on China, do find it difficult to infuse gas into the energy mix to the extent that they wish to. I mean, they wish to because gas is a clean fuel and, uh, um, you know, it, uh, it may be a bridge fuel, but it's a flexible fuel. But... Um, Certainly in India, or unlike the US, uh, for reasons of relative prices, we have not found, and I don't think the Chinese have found, that at least in the merit order of dispatch, you get gas displacing coal very easily. Now, you are lucky here that the gas is basically onshore and you've got very competitive uh, price discovery at Henry Hub and stuff like that. So just on the basis of economics, it is gas that uh, is displacing coal in the US. So I could turn your question around to ask, is that going to be the situation anytime soon in um, in India, and for all kinds of reasons, but most importantly, landed cost, but also transportation infrastructure, that seems to be a lot further off than uh, even the government would want. And I understand that that's true in, uh, in China as well, but I, I don't uh, follow China that closely. So then the question becomes, where else should gas come into the fuel mix? And the reason why you know, Shell's um, investment uh, in a fully owned pipeline um, and uh, regasification terminal at uh, Hazira has been a success, has, has been not for grid electricity, but it has been for, uh, if you like, captive electricity in plants that needed uh, more reliability than the grid was 
in the past able to offer, although in Gujarat that now, which is where Hazira is, that's been handled, but really much more as a source of industrial heat. So gas, domestic gas in India has been pledged largely to the fertilizer industry, and that's the reason for many of the price controls on it. Increasingly now, the government is uh, prioritizing uh, city gas applications. They're also, which is to say, using gas as a cooking fuel, as a residential fuel. Uh, it's, uh, as I said, they are going big time, partly because it helps them gain uh, the women's vote for LPG as a cooking fuel. So net-net, uh, the, the final applications of gas seem to be in areas outside power generation rather than within power generation. And I think it's 15,000 megawatts of gas assets at the moment are stranded in India because uh, demand is down and uh, they're not competitive with the stuff that's, uh, that's around them. I mean, it's, uh, it's paradoxical. I'm not sure I fully understand it, but um, the, uh, the reality of the moment is that gas is not actually flourishing, at least in power generation, even though it should be. Thank you. Yes. Um all of what you're leading to in your comments, can you really have a national energy policy in India because so much power historically has been given to the individual states and those states have very different interests as far as whether they're rural or whether they're uh, urban. And I'm wondering if you're really looking for a compromise system that uh, allows states to have a greater role than you would normally have if you dictated a national energy policy. And second question tied into that is, um, how much influence do uh, outside companies like Ford's recent announcement that by 2025 they will dramatically lower their manufacture of internal combustion engines? Uh, do those kind of announcements and those kind of decisions have on the policymakers in India? Both uh, excellent questions, um, and you know, one could um, sort of pursue where they lead um, for for half an hour. Um, so, uh, there's a lot that India can learn and should learn from the U.S. on the regulatory. Um, and coordination side. And, you know, I think that um, energy policy as such, we have a system of lists in our constitution of competence. There's a central list, which includes things like diplomacy, defense, etc. There's a state list, which includes things like agriculture and cities. And energy, I, I believe, falls in the concurrent list. So it is already constitutionally the case that uh, responsibilities are shared between the, um, the center and the states. And indeed, if you look at the, uh, oops, if you look at the, uh, um, the fleet of um, power generation stations, a lot of the new capacity has had nothing to do with the center. So we have some big utilities, the, the largest of which is called the National Thermal Power Corporation, which is a government of India enterprise. But lots and lots of the local power plants in, in, in India, like in China, are commissioned by the states, they're financed by the states, they feed into the state grid. Uh, so the issue does become coherence and consistency. Now, the US does this partly through FERC and partly through, in a sense, the Energy Information Administration, you know, which try, tries to share information so that you know, private investors can make their own decisions. And I think India is moving in the direct, that direction, should move in that direction transparency about what's going on, and then leave it up to either states or private, uh, the private sector to take its own investment decisions. And that's then the only way that you can, to some extent, 
uh, deal with the issue of stranded assets because then it's not the headache of the federal government or the union government. It's, it's, a, it's a commercial uh, decision. Um, I think there's a fear in India, uh, amongst Indian policymakers, that if you, that if you went as far, too far down that path, uh, then that you just have an investment strike and you need the capacity. So you know, there's a balance uh, to, be, to be struck there. So that was your first question on, um, on federalism. Remind me of your second question? question was the influence of... Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, well, um, so, the, what haunts Indian policymakers is the possibility of leapfrogging, which in one area did prove possible, which was mobile telephony. I mean, basically, we, there we were able to seize a new technology, customize it to the Indian environment, and basically bypass a lot of fixed line infrastructure and do it at a competitive price that made it available to, for mass deployment, okay? And uh, this was clever policy, it was bringing in the private sector. I think people are searching for whether mobilizing scale can allow you to do that in the energy area. Now there's one promising example and there's one thing which is a bit more blue sky. The promising example is that this government essentially uh, aggregated demand for LED lighting under and provided a, if you like, consolidated contract for the manufacture of, uh, of LED lights and manage just on the basis of scale to reduce the price by to a fifth of what the, the private sector would ordinarily have done. So there's a similar aspiration with electric mobility, okay? But um, I think I mean, my um, prior, or my, uh, my, my belief on India is that there's only the, so far that you can have regulation, uh, if you like, triumph over costs. If the technology is cost effective, it'll get snapped up. And that's what happened with telephony. And I think that our private sector is very good at business model innovation for getting the stuff out there. But I, I think to, um, and so the government does have plans. Uh, so they're starting, for example, with city commercial fleets and bus fleets, public transport fleets. It's certainly in their mind that if they were to provide enough assurances of scale, then we could end up with an electric mobility fleet which uh, was fit for purpose for India. But, you know, it's not going to be Tesla's, that's for sure. All right. Well, thank you, Suman. Why don't we start here, stop here. Uh, this has certainly been uh, an enlightening talk, pun intended. Uh, uh, very interesting. So please join me in thanking Suman for coming today. Thank you. And I want to... I want to thank all of you for braving the weather, and I, I hope that you have a, are safe getting home today. And